Hello and welcome to eBible Fellowship Sunday Afternoon Bible Study. We're studying Psalm 37 and today will be study number 20. And we're presently reading in Psalm 37 verse 25, which says, I have been young and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. And as uh, we've continued in this psalm, verse after verse, the Lord has been contrasting time and again the righteous with the wicked. And now uh, David, who is being moved by the Holy Spirit to write this psalm, is giving a testimony from his own personal experience. And uh, this is a uh, a fact, this is a truth that God is declaring through him. And David personally uh, is witnessing that in his life, from the time that he was young until the time that he is old, and, and this lets us know that at the time he's writing Psalm 37, he is an older man. David Uh, died at the age of 70. We don't know exactly how old he is at this point, but um, he he is an older man, and uh, he is letting us know that all throughout the days of his life, and he had a very eventful life. If you remember, he was just a ruddy youth when uh, he went to battle Goliath, and he slew the giant with a sling and a stone, and he he was a young man when he was put in charge of a company and went forth fighting the Philistines, and he was still a relatively young man at the age of 30 when he became king of Israel. And so, uh, of course, as king, he would have seen many things. Nothing would have been hid from him And so this declaration of David is uh, quite a statement. I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. And we're going to um, analyze this verse and check it out and, and see exactly what is in view here. Um, as we compare spiritual things with spiritual. And the first thing we want to look at are these words, young and old. I have been young and now am old. And, of course, we we all understand this in, in the natural sense. He, he was born into the world, and now he's old. And this is something during his lifetime that he has never seen, the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. And we could also uh, look at our own lives, those of us that have lived some time in the world and, and make similar type statements. This is something that we have noticed from our own personal experience. But is that is that exactly what God is saying here? Could there be a spiritual meaning in view uh, with David having been young and now old? Well, let's let's take a look at Psalm 71. In Psalm 71, and we're going to read um, a good portion of this psalm. Let's begin with verse 5, where it says, For thou art my hope, O Lord Jehovah, thou art my trust from my youth. By thee have I been holden up from the womb. Thou art he that took me out of my mother's bowels. My praise shall be continually of thee. And then we'll go down to verse 9. Cast me not off in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength faileth. For mine enemies speak against me. And they that lay wait for my soul take counsel together, saying, God has forsaken him. Persecute and take him, for there is none to deliver him. O God, be not far from me. O my God, make haste for my help. Let them be confounded and consumed. 
that are adversaries to my soul. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor that seek my hurt. But I will hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day, for I know not the numbers thereof. I will go in the strength of the Lord Jehovah. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. O God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to everyone that is to come. Now here we we have some similar statements in this Psalm 71 of the Lord being with his people from their youth and and, uh, also a prayer that, that they not be cast off in the time of old age and not forsaken when their strength faileth. And notice that the enemies speak against me, it said in verse 10, saying, God has forsaken him, persecute and take him, for there is none to deliver him. Now, God did not forsake him. It was the enemies uh, who are saying this. God didn't forsake him, but, but rather the enemies. And uh, so we're, we're more interested. This is uh, curious how God is speaking of youth and old age. And it, it could be, it could be that old age uh, may identify with our present time, with the period that we're living in, in the day of judgment. If we look at what we're reading in Psalm 37 and some other places, uh, as far as being young and now being old, as uh, if we look at it in the light of the body of true believers or the testimony of the believers in this world. There was a period of time where God likens his people's sharing of the gospel to youth. And there is a period of time wherein God likens the ongoing uh, sharing of truth from the Bible as old age. We, we could look at it this way, and I, I um, uh, think that we can based on a couple of passages. Let's go to John chapter 21. In John 21, this is the chapter after the, the uh, great, catch of fish are brought in a, a great multitude 150 and three fish pointing to uh, all the elect that God saved during the great tribulation period they are brought in or brought to the Lord Jesus and this is the point where the Lord asks Peter three times if he loves him and Peter says yea Lord thou knowest that I love thee And three times the Lord uh, returns a response and says, feed my sheep. Well, twice he says that. And then one time he says, feed my lambs. In John 21 and verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Now, uh, this is highly significant because it is teaching us that after the great catch of fish, after the great multitude becomes saved out of great tribulation, and they are brought safely to the Lord, 
safely uh, to the land where the Lord was, that there is additional commandment from Christ to his people as Peter is representative of the true believers and in which God is, first of all, asking uh, Peter as well as each one of us, do you love me? Now, what is love? Well, the Bible says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And now, uh, Christ is stressing the purpose of God for the period after the Great Tribulation, immediate, uh, those days after that tribulation, as Mark thirteen twenty four says. And this will be a period of time where the love of Christ will be put to the test. Do you love me? He is asking each child of God. And of course, the true believer, as Peter, responds, Yes, Lord, you know I love you. And, and we love him because he first loved us. That is, he, he did the work of salvation in uh, offering up himself on our behalf. And as a result of this, we are given the new spirit and a new heart and the indwelling Holy Spirit. And this leads us to love him. We love him because he first loved us. And we demonstrate our love through keeping his commandments. Well, now there's a great test of love in store for Peter as well as for us. Because Jesus is saying to Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. And, and by the way, this is something that Peter will never forget, of course, this uh, word of the Lord spoken to him must have it, it must have just um, went straight to his heart because it says in First Peter chapter five in verse one, the elders which are among you, I exhort who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Even later in his life, as the Lord is directing him to write this epistle, Peter is thinking of feeding sheep. Yes, it penetrated into his mind, into his consciousness, into his heart, feed my sheep and it became his lifelong task until his death well uh, god is using peter to make this statement to us today in this period of time of living in the day of judgment feed my sheep if you love me feed my sheep and and why why the connection with loving him and feeding sheep well, we can see very clearly now from this vantage point uh, of where we are at in time that uh, these are very trying days, very uh, difficult days. There, There is um, a great test of all of the people of God, and uh, it, it's not very exciting. It's not very dramatic uh, to leave the task of evangelizing the world um, in order that sheep might be found, lost sheep, that individuals might hear the gospel and become saved, and then transition to a time period in which you feed the sheep. Uh, feeding sheep is rather mundane. It, it's, it's a simple task. They're, all the sheep are there, and, and they're hungry, and you have to go and feed them. And this is nothing like seeking them out. Seeking them out by traveling all over the earth and, and seeking them out by, um, by going forth with the gospel in order that they might be found. Oh, that was 
uh, wonderfully exciting and and it really a joyful task. But feeding sheep, it it's it's plain, it's dull, uh, it, it's just boring almost. And and yet we cannot overlook the fact that this is the commandment of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what he is commanding his people to do. Feed my sheep. Take care of them and minister to them. Be a servant towards them. Share the truth that you have learned with them. Teach them the Bible. This is feeding sheep. And it is the commandment that the Lord is giving. And therefore, since it's a commandment, to do it, to perform the doing of it, would be a demonstration of love. And a very hard task for the true believer to, um, to come from the field in which we were just uh, completely involved with getting out the message of Judgment Day approaching on May 21. And th- that was like, the, th- that had all the drama of a great battle of uh, a tremendous warfare. And to go from all of that action, all of that uh, tremendous um, busyness to quickly in a day transition to the time of feeding sheep. Well, oh, will you still love me? Will you still uh, do as I command, do as I say? Well, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee, Peter responds. And, and so too do the true believers love Christ and will do as he says. Well, in this context of John 21, we find the great catch of fish, which are picturing those that were saved during the Great Tribulation. And then the Lord's instruction towards his people for this present time of feeding sheep. And then it goes on to say in verse 18, as Christ once again is addressing Peter, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, He saith unto him, Follow me. Now, Christ is speaking to Peter, and again, Peter is representative of the true believers, and he's telling him of when he was young that Peter would gird himself and walk whither uh, thou wouldest. But then he contrasts that with, with the statement, But when thou shalt be old... Thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. And verse 19 explains, This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And then the concluding statement of follow me reminds us of one of the first things that Jesus said to Peter when, when he met him. Uh, follow me uh, um, when he was a fisherman. And and then uh, Christ made him to become a fisher of men as he became one of the twelve. Well, what is the Lord saying here? Why why this reference to being young and, and to being old and girding himself and then another will gird him? Well, what we have, I think, is the Lord is making reference to the life of the true believer in this world. And just like an individual's life, there is a period of youth and then a period of old age. We don't seem to read anything about middle age in the Bible. At least I, uh, yes, there might be statements of an individual being 
a certain age. But as far as statements like this or verses like this, it's just youth and old age. There doesn't seem to be any middle period of time, just from youth to old age. And I think we'll understand that when we go to another verse. And when Peter becomes old and is girded by another and carried where he would not, that is signifying his death. And we have entered into a time where we we are dying according to revelation chapter 14 it it says in verse 13 and this is following um a language which is describing a judgment day and the drinking of the cup of the lord's indignation it's it's the wrath of god and then it says in verse 12 here is the patience of the saints Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We realize that there's a need of patience at this time. But notice also, here are they that keep the commandments of God. That is, here are they that love Jesus. If you love me, keep my commandments. Peter, lovest thou me? And yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. Feed my sheep. And this is a time in which God's people will demonstrate their love to him by doing his will and and continuing to keep his commandments even through a fiery trial of faith, even in a time of severe testing of them. And then it goes on to say in verse 13, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. And we've looked at this verse before, and we've seen that uh, actually um, this should read, Blessed are the dead which are dying in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. See how God is referring to his people. They're the dead in Christ, but they're not physically dead. They're alive upon the earth. They're living in the day of judgment. This is something that was never previously known. We had always thought that the true believers would be taken out of the world. Actually, uh, many have thought the true believers would be taken out before the Great Tribulation. But we were corrected on that, and we, we learned, no, the believers go through the Great Tribulation. Now we've had to receive another bit of correction. The true believers go through the day of judgment. We live on the earth, and yet dying. We are dying in the Lord, and we are taking up our cross, and our members are being put to death. We, we are living daily for Christ. And, and as, um, um, well, it says, let's just quickly turn there in Romans chapter 6. God points out how spiritually this is, uh, where he says in verse 2, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And, and so on. So when we become saved, we are dead to sin and, and we have died in Christ. The, this is what God means. We live, it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, as unknown and yet well known as dying. And that's the same word, a, a participle, just as we find in Revelation 14. And behold, we live. Uh, you see, we, we live physically. And as well as spiritually, we're alive, even though it's as if we are dying. 
Well, uh, this is what Christ is saying to Peter, that during the time period in which uh, you feed sheep, as spiritually it is pointing to the elect living in our day, you will be dying. You will be taking up your cross, following me. This is the death in which you will glorify God. This is the manner in which you will finally die and enter into the kingdom of heaven. You will, you will first feed sheep. And, and then uh, after that is accomplished, I will bring you into my kingdom. And that's what the Lord is saying to each one of us. Now let's go to one other place in the book of Ecclesiastes. And we'll, we'll read some related things to what we've been discussing in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. And I'll, I'll read verse 1 uh, and I'll read it carefully and then we'll just think about that and then read verse 2. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, 1, it says, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. You know, we can see how this relates to uh, physical aging, it, it is true that during our youth, uh, we seem to have the most enjoyment out of life. And then as we age physically, well, then the aches and the pains and, and things uh, are, uh, are not as enjoyable. There's not as much pleasure in them at all. And yeah, we can see how this has uh, some application to um, the natural world and, and, and just how people live their lives. But that, of course, is not the focus of the Bible. The focus of the Bible is the gospel. And here the Lord is saying, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. And now the next statement is going to amplify, it's going to fill in what the days of the youth are or what is applying to that period of time, while, that is, the days of the youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. This means that the days of thy youth are not evil days. They are days in which you may have pleasure in them. And, and, well, what does that mean? Well, the days of our youth are a time when the evil days have not yet come. And the evil days is a reference to Judgment Day. And, of course, we, would, uh, we wouldn't have realized that until we learn that Judgment Day, singular, is much longer than a single day. And uh, we, we thought it would be five months, but actually the duration is longer than that. There's a good possibility that Judgment Day may continue for 1,600 days. And so we can see why uh, the Bible refers to it as the evil day, and it does, as well as evil days, plural. And Ecclesiastes 12.1 is making reference to the entire period of Judgment Day and calling it evil days. And not only days, but years, nor the years draw nigh. Now this is helpful to us. It, it, it may not be the uh, news we want to hear, we, we would like for this time to, uh, to be done. Yet God here is indicating that Judgment Day will be a period of years, more than one. And we expect, it, with the good possibility of 1,600 days, uh, for Judgment Day to actually continue for f over four years. Four years, four months 
and I think 16 days uh, is the duration of 1600 days. And, and so this is uh, fitting what we have learned. The evil days are a period of years, nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say. Now this last statement is something that will be said in the evil days or these evil years, we can understand them. I have no pleasure in them. Now, let's think about this word pleasure. Remember that the Lord says in um, in Ephesians, in the New Testament epistle to the Ephesians, that he has saved people. The only reason um, why God gives for saving one and not another, saving his elect, is that he has done so according to his good pleasure. It pleases God. He is pleased and takes pleasure in saving his elect and in those that he has determined to save uh, from uh, or before the foundation of the world. It is all by the pleasure of God. He, he delights in saving sinners. And on the other hand, the Bible tells us that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Remember those passages in the book of Ezekiel. I think you'll find in Ezekiel 18 and, and uh, possibly chapter 33, where God speaks of the watchman that must blow the trumpet and warn the people and then he asks the question of, of the unsaved, why will ye die? Why? Well, I, actually, I'm, I think I'm getting that a little backwards. Let me uh, turn to Ezekiel 33, and I'll read verse 11. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord Jehovah, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? So here God indicates he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And yet they must die because the wages of sin is death. And, and God will uh, fulfill the justice that the law demands he will kill the sinner. He will destroy him with the second death. He will annihilate all that have uh, transgressed and offended and rebelled against him. And yet, despite carrying out the law's demand that the individuals who have sinned against it die, God takes no pleasure in that compared to taking great pleasure in the salvation of certain ones. So there, there's the contrast that really again speaks to the good character of the person of God. He, he's not a monster. He's, he's um, a good and merciful and gracious and kind God. And, and when he has opportunity to bestow his grace. He delights and takes pleasure in it. But on the other hand, he must destroy the sinner forevermore, but takes no pleasure in that action. And, and none at all in the sense that he does with salvation. Well, this is the character of the evil days. That it is a period of time in which thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. And this is speaking to the believer, to the true believer. We take pleasure in what pleases God. We have an ongoing desire to do the will of God. We delight in serving him. And if salvation pleases God, it pleases us. If it gives him pleasure, it gives his people pleasure. And it did. We, we took great joy in ministering the gospel in order that others might save. But the character of Judgment Day, a time 
here called evil days, is one in which you will take no pleasure in. That's because there is no more salvation. There is no more finding sheep. There is feeding sheep, yes, but there is no more deliverance for any others. And therefore, it is a time in which God and the people of God take no pleasure in it. Because this day of judgment is associated with death. Death has come upon the world. Death because their fates have been sealed once God shut the door. All um, have been guaranteed uh, who were unsaved prior to May 21. Once God shut that door, their, their eternal fate was sealed and and they are guaranteed to die forevermore. And there is no pleasure in that. The people of God, it, we're, we're not pleased at all that the commandment of God, that the Bible is teaching that the door is shut. We were, uh, we were very eager doorkeepers, excited and happy. And, and we, we took satisfaction and sharing with people that the door was wide open in the time of the great tribulation. God was saving a great multitude. Oh, won't you go to him? Won't you seek the Lord and cry out to him for his mercy? Perhaps he might have mercy upon you. And oh, we delighted in that. But in these days, we, we cannot share that news. We, we cannot share that information we are doorkeepers that must inform people the door is now shut and, and there's no pleasure in this. Well, it goes on to say here in verse 2, and let me read from verse 1 into 2. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. And, of course, the days of youth are the time period in which the evil days have not come. It is old age. It is old age when the evil days come. And it is old age when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. And then in verse 2, while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. That is... The, the days of youth are a time when the sun or the light, the moon or the stars are not darkened. In other words, God is likening youth to a time in which the light of the gospel and, and these celestial bodies are, are pictures of spiritual lights of the gospels, the sun identifies with the Lord Jesus himself, and the moon um, relates to the word of God or the law of God and the stars, the body of believers who carry the gospel message. And it is during the time of youth that these things are not darkened. In other words, they're shining. The light of the gospel is shining into the world. It is the day of salvation. It is a time in which people can hear and become saved during the time period of our youth. Uh, and the implication is when we are no longer young, when our youth has come to an end, when we become old, then the sun and the light, the moon and the stars will be darkened. It, it is a time immediately after the tribulation of those days, as Matthew chapter 24 and verse 29 tells us, and in which the sun is darkened and the moon shall not give its light and the stars shall fall from heaven. That is what God is saying here. And then begins the evil days. Then begins a period of years in which thou shall say, I have no pleasure in them. Now is the time of our old age in which another is girding us 
and carrying us. And, and this is how we are dying and a time period in which we are to follow the Lord and take up our cross and crucify ourselves as to offer up ourselves on behalf of the Lord. Well, just one final statement here in verse 2. While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. During the days of our youth, it was when the latter rain fell. Actually, the periods of rain, as God had the early rain during the time of the church age and brought in the first fruits, and the latter rain during the, the time of the Great Tribulation, when finally he completed his salvation plan. But after the days of youth and old age, well, now the clouds return and there, there's no more rain, I think is the implication with that statement. Well, we can see that the uh, days of youth relate to the time in which the gospel is available to the world and old age it's implied is a time when it is not available and that would seem to fit with john 21 and and we can see how it relates also to our verse in psalm 37 i have been young and now am old yet have i not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread now this uh, takes on a different meaning because now it's not just spanning the life of David, but it is a statement that spans the life of God's people throughout history, really, where uh, whether the sun is shining in its brightness and strength, or whether it has been darkened. It's um, letting us know that God will never forsake his people. He will never allow them uh, to go hungry. He will never uh, leave nor forget his people. And this is something that all of us today uh, desperately need to know and, and to keep in mind and to realize that just because God has finished evangelizing the world and he's no longer saving does not mean he is finished with his people. He has not left us. Uh, well, he's left us in a sense of trying us, yes, but he's not left us. He's not forsaken us at all. And we'll see that as we look at this word forsaken here. As we continue on, let, let's take a look. What does it mean that God will not forsake them? Well, um, let's turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 31, and we'll find this same word forsaken a few times. In Deuteronomy 31, it says in verse 5 and 6, And Jehovah shall give them up before your face, that ye may do unto them according unto all the commandments which I have commanded you. Be strong and of a good courage. Fear not nor be afraid of them. For Jehovah thy God, he it is that doth go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And there is a very comforting statement. And But in the very same chapter, a little further on, in verses 16 and 17, we seem to read something that contradicts this. And it says there, And Jehovah said unto Moses, Behold, Thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go a-whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land, whither they go to be among them, and will forsake me, and break my covenant which I have made with them. Then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured, and many evils and troubles shall befall them. So that they will say in that day, Are not these evils come upon us, because our God is not among us? Well, let, let's hold it a second. God just just finished saying in verse 6, He would not forsake him. He actually repeated it 
in verse 8 of Deuteronomy 31. And Jehovah, he it is that doth go before thee, he will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. But several verses later, and God is saying, They have forsaken me, therefore I will forsake them. And it will be said that uh, God is not among us. Well, how can we understand this? We can understand this once we realize that there are two different people in view. And God has relationship with both. He has a relationship with Israel of old, as well as the New Testament church, which is on a corporate basis. They are his outward representatives, or were, of the kingdom of heaven to the world. And God had a relationship dependent upon them keeping his law. And if they failed to keep his law, then he could forsake them and did. He did this with national Israel, the ten tribes in the north, and then Judah in the south. And the same relationship was in place for the New Testament churches and congregations. They also had responsibility to keep his law. They failed to do so. And after an allotted period of time uh, in which God gave space for them to repent and they did not, God forsook them. He gave them up. He turned them over into the hands of Satan. Yet on the other hand, the earlier verses in Deuteronomy 31 are speaking to the other people, the other group, the true believers. We, we could say the, the eternal Jerusalem, not the corporate Jerusalem, the Jerusalem above, not the Jerusalem below. They're speaking to the elect, and God will never, never leave those people. Um, if we turn to Isaiah chapter 62, it says in verse 4, Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hezebah, and thy land Beulah, for Jehovah delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. Here God is speaking to his bride, the eternal church, the, the elect, and he's saying, you'll no more be turned forsaken, you will be married. It also says towards the end of that chapter, the last verse in Isaiah 62, verse 12, and they shall call them the holy people the redeemed of Jehovah, and thou shalt be called sought out, a city not forsaken. And you see, this, this is what God just did during the time of the Great Tribulation. He forsook earthly Jerusalem. He, he gave them up. Uh, he left them. And uh, he was no more with them, helping them in any way. And yet he never, never gave up his people. Uh, this is why it says in Zechariah 14 concerning the day of Jehovah in verse 2, For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled and the women ravished. That is, the earthly Jerusalem or the churches and congregations Yes, they'll be destroyed. But then it goes on to say, And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. In the very same verse, God is assuring us and encouraging us that this was needful to know. Look, when I judge the outward body, the corporate church, and that's a judgment on them it is not a judgment on you. It's not possible for an elect child of God to be cut off from the city, for God to forsake them. Uh, you know, God um, has given us tremendous assurance that he will never leave us. It says in Hebrews 
chapter 13, in verse 5, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. What a wonderful promise this is of God, that he will never leave nor forsake any one of his people. And this is very much a marriage vow. God has um, married his bride, and, and he here is taking the vow, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. There's no need to include that phrase that is necessary for this life till death do we part, because God lives forever, and he has granted eternal life to his people, and they also will live forever. So there will never be a a separation between them. The um, beautiful words of Romans chapter 8 are applicable to the spiritual marriage between the Lord and and his redeemed people. It says in verse 36, As it is written, For thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And this word separate is the identical word that's found in Matthew 19, when the Lord Jesus says, What God has joined together let not man put asunder. That's the same word as separate, put asunder. There is never anything that will put asunder the marriage of the Lord Jesus Christ and his bride that that he has decked in white, that he has washed from uh, her sins and made pure and ready to dwell with him forevermore in that glorious, blissful, eternal marriage between God and his people. And, of course, this is why there is not to be divorce for any reason in the law of God, as God follows his law, and and there is no possibility of divorce in the earthly marriage, uh, because that is the law of God, that God follows in the heavenly marriage that he has arranged between himself and his people. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And that is true of the earthly marriage. There is no legal, biblical way for any man or woman to leave that marriage. Uh, If anyone is married, they cannot be divorced legally or biblically in the sight of God. Well, we have more to look at in our psalm concerning he has not seen his seed begging bread. But that will have to wait until we get together uh, the next time in our Bible study of Psalm 37.